it's Amory um, back at you. And today we're going to do a study on John. We're going to do verses four, chapter 4, verses 43 to the end of the chapter. And uh, before I start, I want to just thank uh, Sarah Jane and David for all of the work they've done here at, uh, on our social media and uh, our worship on Sunday. They're the very reason why we are able to provide a worshipful experience for our community, and I thank you very much. So here's what I plan uh, on doing. I've heard some feedback that with these Bible studies, we're getting a lot of information, not a lot of interaction, and people miss the interaction from our um, personal Bible studies. So I was thinking that the, um, the way to go is I'm going to actually do a study today, and then if you will send me your email, if you're interested in being on an online Zoom conversation afterwards, we can talk about this or any other questions, to revem, R-E-V-E-M, at shaw.ca. I need your email to invite you to the Zoom conversation. Um, so if you're interested in that, that would be great. But I'm going to open us with prayer. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together. We thank you for this opportunity to learn your word. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you open our eyes and our ears so that we may know you better. Amen. So I'm sitting outside here and uh, enjoying the sun, I must admit. Uh, it has been wonderful weather. I mean, you couldn't ask for better weather down here. So look at my glass. What's wrong with those? I can't go down to my optometrist because I think he's closed. So you're going to have to look at crooked glasses for a while. Anyways, it's been absolutely beautiful here. And... Uh, it doesn't even feel like there's anything weird going on in the world, to be honest, but uh, we know there is, and it's been in our prayers. So what I'm going to study on today is we're going to keep building up on John's Gospel, and what I'm going to do for the next little while is we're going to do a study once a week on Wednesdays, and then I'm going to spend some time um, after the study. Uh, again, we'll have a meeting on Zoom if you'll send me your email to revamatshaw.ca so I can invite you, and that'll be Fridays on, at 7 and then we, I'm going to preach this verse, and I know a lot of people really like when I do that, when I teach it, and then you get to see it preached. It's more meaningful. So we're going to do one study a week on, on Wednesdays at 6. We're going to have the um, Zoom conversation about it on uh, Friday at 7, and we're going to preach on it. So how do I preach this text today? Well, it's an interesting text. It's, uh, it's not quite as elaborate for sure, in the symbolism as we get in other uh, spots in John where, you know, you see the light and the darkness and all of those things. In this particular case, we have the healers, the healing of an official son, and it's a famous story. Um, and it, it, you really have to have a close reading to understand what John's doing with it. And it's not necessarily praising, praiseworthy of the community it's involved in. So, after the two days, he departed from for Galilee. Now, we know Galilee is his... Ugh, this is driving me insane. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. There. Well, sort of. Um, after the two days, he departs for Galilee. And, and Galilee is where Jesus is from. Now, the first thing you notice in this text is that Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So why would John add that in? He's heading into Galilee. He's just left Samaria. And yet now it's saying that he doesn't have honor in his hometown. Right away, that's a teaching tool to say that it's going to look uh, like he's going to be critical of the expectation of the people of the Galileans. Now, there's some debate. Does Jesus mean Galilee is his hometown or Judea? Does it, uh, it, it's probably Galilee. But anyways, I'll let, leave that with you guys. Um, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They welcomed him at this point. Now, I want you to remind you that the Galileans are not going to always be welcoming of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And the reason they have welcomed him, and yet John has noted that they don't always welcome a prophet in his own town, which he's obviously referring to Jesus, is because of the next line. Having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. Now, he's clearly talking about the wedding of Cana and the... Um, what they would have seen as a miraculous action. So prophets did miraculous actions, and that's how things worked. So they saw it as an incredible action, something like Elijah would have done, or one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, an action that means that God was with him. So why is 
this a criticism of the Galileans? Well, we're going to find out very shortly. Having seen all he's done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So <clears throat> what has happened is these people from Galilee, since the time of the wedding of Cana, have now come back. Probably haven't heard of the cleansing of the temple, because I don't think that would have been very popular action for most Jews as they held the, the temple in reverence. And he has gone through, and now he's gone through Samaria, and it's been a very interesting design that uh, that John's done. He's taken us from Nicodemus, who was a leader and a teacher of Israel. He doesn't get it. Um, our, my own people didn't recognize me. We see that in, in John 1, that, his own, that the light of the world came and darkness didn't discern it. Even his own people don't discern it. And then the Samaritan woman, the Syrophoenician woman, she gets it and she's the one that's the outcast well now we're back into what they would consider a jewish circle and here he is and they had gone to the feast so he comes into cana in galilee where he had made the water to wine so he's back the reese and he wants you to connect that that moment of the first sign there's going to be seven signs in john's gospel and that's designed again because of the creation motif all right and at capernaum there was an official whose son was ill now this official <clears throat> he would have been an, uh, a person of significance in that community. And there is some debate whether this is a mirror of the uh, Synoptics Gospel story about the, uh, um, the Roman legionnaire who uh, has a sick child and Jesus uh, heals them and then acknowledges that he's never seen faith like that in Israel. So there's some people who say, well, John's just using that story and twisting it. Well, there's an assumption, and you always have to be careful with theologians. We, uh, we tend not to think things through as well as we should. There's an assumption there that Jesus could only have done this once. And if you know itinerant uh, preachers and ministers, you know that they don't teach the same thing once, and nor do they only do the same thing once. They, uh, and I'm sure that uh, in that culture there were many sick children, and, and there's, just, just, there's no correlation between the Gentiles healing of a child, which was so radically culturally different, and then a Jewish official's son um, who was ill. Now, when the man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he's at the point of death. Uh, hard for us to understand this because we live in a culture that doesn't believe in miraculous healings. That's, that's just reality. That isn't the culture here. Uh, clearly, um, in the ancient world, they believed, uh, both pagan and, and Jewish, that uh, healings happened, that there were holy men that could do it. Uh, the Jews believed in the prophet. We already see that John uh, sees Jesus as at least a prophet that's not welcome in his own town. He obviously, he's more. And so for him to come down to this point, uh, they didn't have the medications. And we also see that pandemics are not a new thing. There was sickness and death long before COVID-19. So Jesus said to him, and this is the critique, and this is what I have to take it on Sunday. This is the middle of the text, what they call a, uh, you know, this is the, the hinge text to this. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. It's an interesting thing. Um, signs and wonders uh, are, the Gospels are very critical of seeking those things first. Um, the Gospels do not ever seem to uh, think that the signs and wonders are going to bring to genuine faith necessarily. And we're certainly going to see that again and again. Um, in fact, Jesus says, unless you see, even if you see somebody raised from the dead, you won't believe. Um, so the question for Jesus is, is this really a definite belief? Now, it's interesting that we, we saw when Philip runs into Jesus and he says, I saw you under the tree and I believe you're the Messiah. He goes, wow, you believe because of that? So you can already see that in John's gospel, it's, it's through hearing and belief in who Jesus is that's far more important than the, the signs and wonders. And I think part of the criticism within John's gospel is when you're looking just for the signs and wonders, you're missing what this God is about, what he, his goal is about. Um, I think what you're missing in John's gospel is this is the creator God that's bringing renewal to the heavens and the earth. And his, he's not a genie. He's not coming down to make our life a little bit more comfortable. Now, that's where I'm going to take it on Sunday. Um, I'll give you guys a little inside. Uh, I'm going to talk about that pastor, that minister down in the States who recently died from COVID-19. After hope, hope, holding services and then saying, well, um, God is bigger than this virus. Um, and some of his people in his church were saying things like, well, the blood of Jesus covers me from disease. 
how do you deal with that in a, a theological way, in a thoughtful theological way? Is that really what the Gospels are saying? And obviously I'm going to take a, a, a run at it on Sunday using this text because I think there's a big mistake that goes on um, in misunderstanding who Jesus is and what his ministry is about. Um, so, um, so the official says, sir, come down before my child dies. Now, Jesus is saying to this community, you're looking for signs and wonders for this, this miraculous, but you're not looking to what's really going on. And I really think that's the problem within the signs and wonders element in the Gospels. It's not that God doesn't want to bring healing to children or to the people of his time, but he recognizes he's on a bigger mission and he wants people to get the bigger mission. He wants them to be changed into his image, not just be there for the result of uh, temporary relief in a very uh, destructive culture. Um, you know, the truth is the official and his son is going to die eventually, probably not living long lives in that culture. Jesus is trying to do something with an eternal perspective, a renewal of creation. And I think that's the criticism in John's gospel. And I think that criticism still spends, if I would, when I go on Sunday, I think that that's the problematic part of, uh, of this particular uh, movement that we call the prosperity gospel. These are people who say, well, if you have enough faith, you'll be healed or, uh, or such, such things, or you'll be rich and healthy and wise. I think, uh, that's the fundamental error is they're misunderstanding what God was doing and what he's doing now and where he's going. And yes, God moves. We see this here and it's wonderful. And uh, God moves throughout time. And uh, that's for sure. But his goal is not just to alleviate temporal suffering. In fact, biblically, it seems that he overcomes through the cross and his restoration through the cross. And it seems that he is not expecting his disciples to fly five feet off the earth without running into the same realities as everyone else, but rather to bear witness to the truth that this God will overcome. I think that the signs, I'm, pre, I'm sure that the signs, why he ap ap appropriates them in this, is that the signs are meaningful in pointing to what God can do and will do. Not necessarily as important to the temporal sign action itself, and I would take that very seriously in the sense of the wedding, the water to wine, which is pointing to the, to the God who is going to purify from his side. You see the water and the wine. Um, the purification is going to come out of him. So you're going to see that in that particular case, and that's why the sign's there is to show something bigger than just turning water into wine. I, I remember somebody preaching a sermon on the water to wine and talking about the the uh how it's a change in the chemistry of the water to wine and how miraculous that was and, and totally missed the point in my opinion about what a sign is a sign is pointing to something else so why is this a sign and he's going to say this is the second sign because god is above sickness and death that's the next one and that he doesn't have to be there that's the striking thing about jesus story here is unlike the prophets of old he doesn't have to hang around so to the uh, to the the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. What an incredible statement. This is such a high Christology um, that clearly this is the creator God. This is the God who is already uh, over life and death. And so, but he's not impressed. He's not impressed with the faith of what he's seeing in Galilee. And he's made that clear. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The man believed the word being that the word of Jesus. And of course, Jesus is the word, right? So he believes that Jesus has the ability to do this. Again, does that mean he believes Jesus is the son of God, the second member of the Trinity, the one who's going to redeem humanity on the cross? Of course not. He believes that Jesus is a godly man and he's a prophet and he can do this. And again, that's not unheard of belief in the ancient world, but he's going to need to have that um, enlightenment as everyone else is. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that the son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. An hour is an interesting word in John's gospel, and I'll let you look into it if you want. Hour has a lot more to do with uh, divine time as it has to do with uh, chronological time. That's just how John uses it. It's a, a word you're going to find again and again. So when he began to get better, and they said to him, and what did they say yesterday at the seventh hour? Well, uh, you see seventh. You, you obviously, you're thinking creation story. You're thinking new creation. You're thinking 
Uh, what's John's gospel all about? It starts off with a creation story. He's got the seventh hours. Number seven means perfection in Jewish numerology. Again, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you have to have it at the seventh hour, it doesn't matter. John's gospel is trying to tell you something theologically as much as he's trying to tell you something historically. It's not that this event didn't happen, but look for that number, that this is the perfection. This is The sign has to do with the perfect God who's doing it in his time, in his hour, in his divine way he's going to bring the healing so not, it's not other words it's not on us it's on god and again you, you look at that gentleman who uh, i think was a terrible witness of christianity who told his people that god was bigger than uh, you know um this virus and he ends up dying it's it's an unfortunate witness but it's an and it's tragic really it's um there's a, a peanuts cartoon where um where we where Lucy's talking to her little brother, I forget his name, and and she talks about how uh, you know the world might end, and then he sees a uh, um, what am I trying to use the word here? Oh, I need somebody to help me here. What am I doing? Sees what you know the Noah's Ark, the rainbow, and <laughs> and he sees the rainbow, and he, she says, "Oh, the world could end. Is it going to be straight?" He, he uses a verse of his. Uh, Genesis, where it says what the rainbow is a sign God is not going to work that way anymore. And she goes, oh, uh, that's comforting good theology. And he says, well, good theology has the power to do that. Um, I can tell you the bad theology has the power to destroy. If I were to talk to that gentleman before, I'd say, is that really the witness we're supposed to have is to go and meet despite uh, government? And are we, this a moment to show great faith or are we showing arrogance and testing God? That, that would be what I'd want to, want to ask. Because as far as I can tell, discipleship in Christ is suffering alongside the world, not uh, not looking like we're above it and more spiritual than it in some holier than that way. So anyways, so he asked them on the hour what they had got better. It's the seventh hour. The fever has left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So there's this connection between the perfect time, the number seven, and Jesus' word. That's the sign that God in Jesus Christ is going to do this incredible action through this moment at the right time. And this is his word that's going to set things to rights. He is the word. He's going to speak it. And he says, your son will live. It's an, a beautiful picture. And he himself believed in all his household. In Jesus, again, what do they believe in? I think that that's a question that the Gospels always leave hanging. Um, it's interesting that this area of Galilee that's so welcoming of Jesus, the one that John just told us is not a prophet's not welcome in his own area, his own town, will eventually, like within very short order in John's Gospel, be out to kill Jesus. So keep your eyes out for that, because obviously the belief system of signs and wonders and the miraculous and the, what I call gene faith does not lead to true faith so this was now the second sign that jesus did when it did when he came from galilee so this is the second and final sign and uh of this section and he's going to move on and again do seven signs so where i'm you know where i'm going to go people ask well how do i develop a sermon i look for those moments in the text that i think john's really trying to emphasize and get, get it back to what jesus is trying to emphasize and you know, you use something like the gentleman who uh, decided that uh, he was God was bigger than COVID and then dies as an example of maybe we need to re reflect on our theological position of God and uh, ask ourselves what Jesus is really on about and what then we should be on about. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? So um, people ask me often in my Bible study about the preparation of sermons. So that's how that's where I go at. And then then I do the hard work, which is trying to put that together, which isn't actually as easy as it probably maybe looks. So so the plan is, that's what I have for today. Um, it's a beautiful text. It's a powerful text when it's understood. And I invite you again to, uh, um, to be part of a Zoom meeting we're going to have on Friday at 7. So what I'm going to do is, again, have one uh, study on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. where I'll go over the text. We'll have a Zoom meeting at 7. I need your email address and your interest, which you can send to revm, R-E-V-E-M, at shaw.ca. You do not have to be a member of Mountain View Church to be part of that. I'd be happy to have St. Giles people and people from all over that I know have joined us since this uh, action. And, uh, yeah, no, I agree. Tony Zapito, 
the seven signs points of advantage. I absolutely, I totally agree. And, and, and his mission, I, I'd go that far too. But I think with that is all wrapped in, isn't it? Like his true identity, the, the, the comment was the seven signs point to his divinity and true identity. I totally agree. And this true identity is wrapped up in his mission and the atonement that's going to come through him a hundred percent. So this is number two of his identity. This is the God who heals the God that's going to redeem the God that's bigger than signs and wonders. Uh, he was the, it, the first sign was all about, uh, uh, purification uh, that it's going to come through him and so I invite anyone who wants to join me on Thursday or sorry Friday at 7 for discussion please send me to revem r-e-v-e-m at shaw.ca so I can add you to the list and I will invite you to our zoom conversation and we can discuss this and other things that you might want to do I know that I've heard the feedback from people that they miss the interaction and I am happy to do it so I will be doing one study again on Wednesdays. I will be doing one interaction on Fridays, and I'll preach the gospel, the preach the text I am teaching on, on that Sunday if you want to follow. I really hope everybody's doing well. Keep washing those hands. Keep doing all those safe things, and uh, keep praying for those people. Um, my heart has been, I've worked with seniors a lot. I've been in a lot of these homes that are being hit so hard. Um, and I think of the families that can't see them. I think that that would be my challenge to all of us is to pray for that situation. You know, uh, Jesus came for the lost and the forgotten. And uh, seniors can be, especially in homes, can be lost and forgotten in our culture, unlike other cultures which honored it. And so let's just pray that maybe this will be a, a re, uh, maybe a time of, of renewal in, in the culture of how to deal with that. All right. Blessings on you. Be safe. We'll see you on Friday. See ya.